when I was asked to, to come here and speak with you, I, I, I was sort of went into sort of a semi-meditative state, uh, plucking, picking weeds in my garden, trying to think about restorative justice. And uh, I, I must say that um, uh, I'm, I'm much attached to the term that I see on this poster here, which is restorative practices. Uh, restorative justice got me to a place where I was trying to get an understanding of what is justice. And the best I could get, the closest I could get to justice was defining a sense of injustice, the absence of something as opposed to being able to define what was in the space. I am attached to the notion of restorative because it's vibrant and alive and it isn't so contained. It is about relationships. And this morning for a few minutes I'm going to talk about uh, the story The Flight of the Hummingbird. And I'm going to use it as a jumping off space to sort of um, introduce myself, my community, my past, and, and some of the practices we're involved in. And I think and I hope that they will resonate with you. I'm feeling that I'm standing in a room full of masters. I am impressed and inspired that you would seize to take a judicial system and change it to something much better. In 1985, I, along with uh, 10 other people, was charged with contempt of court. Now, contempt of court in Canadian legal system is a fairly serious crime. Probably worse than stealing things and hurting people, because basically you're thumbing your nose at the whole system. And this is the charge that we were brought before a fellow named Alan McEachran, who was the Supreme Court uh, Justice from the Supreme Court of of British Columbia. He died recently, so I'm going to be gentle. I was much struck by the sharpness of ears and the way he licked his fangs and extended and withdrew his talons as he looked down on us and begged us, implored us, to bring the case of Aboriginal title and its relationship to the British Crown before him. That's what he wanted. And we didn't give it to him. What he told me, what I learned standing in that lair, I felt, I felt, like, a, I felt like I was in a, a Greek myth. I felt like I was in a cave and this beast was, was going to have at me. I can remember the terror of the night before when we were trying to figure out what are we going to do? Because he asked the question, he says, I'm going to give you a chance to apologize. I'm going to give you a chance to throw yourself at the mercy of the court and promise never to be a bad Indian again. I'm going to allow you the opportunity to promise not to interfere with loggers' right to destroy a 14,000-year-old forest in your backyard, which doesn't really belong to you anyway. So he gave, us, he gave us a week to think about that. And we went home and we were scared. We were just young people. We were frightened. All we knew First of all, we didn't have any lawyers, because every lawyer we met with said, throw yourself at the mercy of the court. Apologize. And we couldn't do that. It just didn't feel right, and we didn't. We were young and stupid enough to believe in something else other than what was presented to us. And so there we were, we were in the lair of the beast. Not a friendly man, I have to say. A very intelligent man, but not a very friendly man. Didn't endure a sense of faith or trust in the system. And when we returned to court, he said to us, this is a court of law, not justice. There is no justice in this room, he was telling me. This is where we give you law. And so the challenge that was faced in front of us was to take his sense of law and our sense of justice and figure out how we could concile these things together. None of us apologized. We couldn't. We stood our ground. We were found guilty, contempt of court, and then sent home. Justice is not an easy thing to find in a courthouse, and it's not a necessarily easy thing to find in Canada. And I think generally that the situation of Indigenous peoples in a colonized world is one that is, uh, as, as the brother was saying, the, the dancer up here, is saying, the statistics are against us. I'm 54 years old. I'm an Aboriginal male. I was raised in the village. My bloodline is clear. 
I was the only pale looking or Anglo looking Haida in a community full of dark haired people and brown eyes. I'm 54 years old. I should have been dead 20 years ago. I should have been in jail. I should have diabetes. Most of my children should be dead or seized by the courts. It's not a happy life to be an Indigenous person in a Canadian embrace. It's a terrible embrace at times. It hurts. It crushes bones. This has been a situation for about 250 years now. When smallpox swept the islands, the people were dying. In some communities, so many people died that there were so few people left to bury them, they would burn the longhouses with the bodies inside. And from one very thriving village, I think probably, and I have to guess, probably a thousand people on the west coast of Haida Gwaii, which is located south of Alaska, only two people survived, an old man and a young girl. That was it. Some estimates say 90% of the people disappeared. In my fortunate case, it came down to a single incident that happened on a northern beach. The smallpox had hit the, the camp, the traveling camp, and most of the people didn't know because these symptoms hadn't started to uh, erupt. Two men who knew that the smallpox had affected the community paddled up to the village, and on the, on the beach, were two young girls playing by themselves, their nieces. And they grabbed the girls, seized the girls. They didn't want to go, they didn't know what was going on, but these two men grabbed the girls and put them into the canoe. The father came running out of the camp. He sees his daughter being taken away in the canoe. He recognizes the people, but he doesn't know what's going on. These are serious times. These are times when the very sense of how the world functions is being shaken where every god you ever had seems to be leaving you. These are not times of peace. These are not times of justice. These are times of war and injustice. And he loaded his single shot musket and he fired at the canoe and he missed the guys. And they took those two girls up to safety in southeast Alaska where our communities also live on the other side of the Canadian-American border, I might add. From those two girls came a lineage that probably comprises over 30% of the northern Haida population out of Masset. And had those girls died to smallpox as everybody else did in that camp, I wouldn't be here. And there'd be a whole lot of vacuums in my community. We survived smallpox. We survived incarceration of our children. We have survived residential school. We have survived the worst, the world's largest military system, the British Empire, could impose upon us. The story is not one of sadness and genocide. That's the facts. I'm not here to, to complain, really. I'm here to celebrate the fact that I am here, that it did survive and that we have survived. I want to talk a little bit about the story, The Flight of the Hummingbird, which I see is everywhere. The story is rooted in Quechua culture, Ecuador and Peru primarily, and I ripped it off from them. I learned appropriation from the best. <laughs> I traveled down to Cusco and outside of Cusco, the region, Cusco is the ancient capital of, of uh, Peru. There is a valley called Parque de Papa. And in that, there are 4,000 varieties of the potato plant, of which 350 are actively cultivated and maintained for their nutritional value. And we are, we're all familiar with potatoes. I mean, if there's anything that joins us in this world, it's probably the spud. <laughs> Monsanto the dear people of Monsanto. God bless them and help them out. They're trying to, um, with the support of the Peruvian government, introduce genetically modified food crops into the, into the region. And the people in that valley are afraid that they'll have some impact on the, on the seed stock. 
They also make some claim that perhaps the tomatoes also originated in this valley. So they're out there today fighting against the Peruvian government trying to protect it. High up in this valley, almost I would think probably 4,100 meters up in the, the Andean plain, there was a small clay house, clay roof, a little bit of clay, a bit of thatch, mud, and at the very top of it was the hummingbird embellished. The forest was on fire and all the animals fled except the hummingbird which flew to the stream and picking up a bead of water dropped it on the flames again and again until the animal said, what are you doing? Subtext, fool. <laughs> and Hummingbird said, I'm doing what I can. And that's the entire story. There There's a couple of things that are striking about this story. One, it's a hummingbird, a very tiny, apparently insignificant creature. The lesson I draw from that is you can fly solo. You can do this by yourself. The second thing is, we don't ever know if the fire is put out. We don't know if the other animals join in. And the reason for that in this parable that comes out of a very ancient Quechuan culture is it's unimportant. Not only can you fly solo, but the outcome is always uncertain and therefore unimportant. The only thing that counts in this story is the process, the sense of activity, the sense of controlling and taking responsibility for the challenge. I'm not here to kick stones on Al McEachern's grave. I'm not here to insult the British parliamentary system or its questionable morality over the last, what, millennium since the Magna Carta. I'll let other people do that. I'm here to celebrate I can fly solo, and I don't know what the outcome is going to be of stopping logging in Haida Gwaii. But I can celebrate the process that brought us to the point where there's fewer trees falling than there ever were before. And where the relationship between white people and Haidas is substantially different than that what is under the control of the legislative system in Canada. When we decided that we had to stop the logging, we looked around and we asked for people to stand with us. There was initially no one to stand with us. We asked a number of prominent people, will you stand on the road with us? Stop the logging of these valleys, the last remnants of a 14,000 year old rainforest, a forest that in our narrative uh, we saw, we saw the first tree coming. We we're connected to this place. It's a long relationship, 14,000 years. And it was going and it was going fast. And everyone was afraid to stand with us. You don't easily stand up against the RCMP, especially now because they have tasers. <laughs> you don't stand up against the entire legislative system. You don't thumb your nose at courts. These are things that we are told not to do. This is the dictate of the, of the forest, if I will. And what I'm thinking about is the animals. When the fire comes, when the challenge comes, when the attack comes, when the injustice is there, we know what to do. We're told what to do. And in the case of the fire in the forest and the flight of the hummingbird, the animals all flee. And I think generally in today's society, when we see an injustice, call the cops. They're in charge. Call the courts. They're in charge. There must be a probation officer around here. They're in charge. The era of special, specialization is all about removing my responsibility as a citizen to, to, to address injustice, the absence of justice. 
So we stood on this logging road, and we did it for what, Susan? 45 days, couple months? And that was pretty newsworthy because nobody else was doing this, believe you me. Indians, oh baby, Indians don't stand up against the police in this country. If you do, you don't stand up for long. But what was different about this one is it was old people, young people, babies, old guys, young guys. It was a community of people. This wasn't a bunch of fellows suffering from hormone toxicity ranting out in the street, raving uh, with ski masks on and Molotov cocktails in one hand in anger and fear. This was the quiet presence of a community. And when people saw us, they saw themselves. And we went very quickly, I think, from being bad guys to being heroes. I can remember a janitor in New Brunswick, which is a province on the other side of Canada, who's probably at that time, I don't know what they'd be making, seven, eight bucks an hour in 1985. He'd send us a check for $150 every month. I don't know who he was. He doesn't know who I was. Something we were doing touched him. Something we were doing connected with him. And he said, that is me. It's not a bunch of renegade Indians on the west coast, BC. That is me. That is me standing like a hummingbird in front of the fire. And he connected with us by sending us a little piece of money, which was a very big gift for him. The case that we were working on was, do we own the land? And we were asking the, the Supreme Court of Canada to decide on that question. Do we, Haidas, own this land outside of the sovereign claim of the Queen? And do we, therefore, then own it within the Constitution of Canada as, as Aboriginal land? I might have actually not got the phrasing quite right there, forgive me. In front of the Supreme Court of Canada, mayors from these communities, of which there are no Haida people living inside, totally dependent on resource extraction from our landscape, went in front of the Supreme Court and said, we trust the Indians more than we trust the provincial or federal governments of Canada. It's different in Haida Gwaii now. In Haida Gwaii, you can walk down the street as an indigenous person, and the first thought that you have when you see a white person or a Canadian person is not opponent, not colonizer, not oppressor. It's friend, it's companion, it's colleague, it's team member. And out of that positive, uh, uh, formula. You get all sorts of opportunities for creativity and joy. Today, there will be no logging on Haida Gwaii that doesn't have the implicit consent of the Haida Nation. That's really unique in this country. We've got a good council, we've got a good leader, we've got a good relationship with our neighbors. I'm not going to put a dollar fifty on it that that's going to last forever. In fact, I'll put two bucks on it, it's not going to last forever. I'll put five dollars on it that politics and personality and ego is going to come up and challenge the group. And maybe challenge the group to the point where it doesn't look like such a rosy picture anymore. But the process of coming together has created something that isn't easily taken away. A sense of trust a sense of accomplishment, and a sense of being in charge and moving out of victimness. And that's only a process, and it's only as good as, 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 uh, as the people who make that commitment to it and renew it on a daily basis. I want to say, I think that you that are here in this room and that have committed yourselves to this cause are masters and heroes, and saints. I'm not using these words casually. You must be, by definition of the task in front of you, emotionally rich human beings with a capacity to care, a capacity to reach out from the safety of your own homes and look out and care for the life and the hurts and the injuries of those around you. I congratulate you on that wonderful process that you've chosen to do. I encourage you to continue to be hummingbirds 
not to feel trampled down when you're solo. There is a need out there for this message of doing the work. 